Good morning, church. And we'd like to welcome everybody to First Baptist Fairdale this morning. We're glad that you're with us for worship. We're excited to open the word and learn together and worship the Lord. I want to invite you to open in your Bibles to Psalm 138 for our call to worship this morning. Psalm 138. And I'd like to remind you as you are turning that we have the 24 hours of prayer coming up this coming weekend. That is going to be this coming Friday and Saturday. There are still some openings on the sign-up sheet downstairs outside the office. So perhaps as you're leaving today, instead of going out the back, you can go down here, go through the office, and uh, you'll, you can sign up for an hour to come and pray. And that's from Friday at 5 p.m. until Saturday at 5 p.m. That's this coming weekend. Also, we've got Bible translation coming on September 20 the 27th. And Marcus and Rachel Lehman and their family are going to be here with us for that. So we're excited about that. So make sure you've got that on your calendar. Uh, they would love to see you, to catch up with you. And uh, Marcus is going to be preaching that Sunday morning. So we're looking forward to that. Again, make sure you're looking at your bulletin. We've got a lot of announcements in there. We don't want you to miss anything. Uh, that is where we uh, communicate a lot of the things that are happening. But let's look now at our, our call to worship, Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have, exalt, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You have stretched out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Let's pray. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for this morning. Lord, may we say with the psalmist that it's with our whole heart that we give thanks to you, that we sing your praises, and that we bow down before you because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And Lord, we know that you've exalted above all things your own name and your word. And God, that is what you have called us as followers of you to be, is to be those who exalt you and what you have said and not ourselves. God, we thank you that you are a God who, though you are high, you regard the lowly. God, though we may walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve our life. And God, we know that you are one who delivers your people. And God, we know that our greatest problem is sin. God, we are sinful, and because of that, we are separated from you. But you've not left us without an answer. You've sent your son, Jesus, fully God, yet fully man. And God, we thank you that you are delivering us from our problem of sin through your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that he has stood in our place, bearing the wrath for our sin that we rightly deserve. And God, we thank you that by faith in him, by believing on Jesus, we are forgiven. We are made new. And God, we are so thankful this morning that as we're gathered in your name, it's Jesus that we make much of this morning. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. Would you stand and worship with us?
Good morning, church. Let's take just a few minutes to welcome and greet each other. Do you return to your seats as we continue in song? in his hand and who has 
has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Bible reading this morning will be from Galatians 3, 
verses 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your law. Lord, we thank you for the law that was our guardian, Lord, the law that, that pointed us to our need for a Savior. Lord, we thank you as we sit here today, Lord, that we're not under that guardian any longer. Lord, because you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law, to do what we were unable to do in our own efforts, to do what we could never do in our own efforts. Lord Christ Jesus fulfilled the law by living it to the letter. And in doing so, Lord, he became what we could not become, right? We could not become right with you. We thank you, Lord, for, for Jesus' life, Lord, and his sacrifice and taking our place on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that in doing so, that he took our sin upon himself, Lord. The sin that we deserved punishment for, he took on himself. We thank you for, for that. We thank you, Lord, for, for as he died and he paid for our sins, Lord, that he rose on the third day. You rose him to life. Lord, and for, for us today, as, as we look at the law, we, we see the burden, we see the weight of, of trying to live by statutes, by, by rules, Lord, and, and we see that we are unable to do that. Lord, we pray that as we look at that, Lord, that we would see how beautiful it is that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to believe in Jesus, Lord, that you would help us to tell others to look to Christ for salvation, to look to Christ for the forgiveness of their sin. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, for your son, Jesus. We love you. We praise you, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing? Sinners poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. And I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Come and welcome God's free bounty glorified True belief and true repentance Every grace that brings tonight And I will arise and go
pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be gathered here this morning, God, and we ask that as we take up this offering that it would be used to further your gospel message here in the community and in the country and the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our pastoral prayer time this morning, we want to pray for children. It's, a, it's an emphasis of ours that we be a church that is of all generations. You often hear us say that the younger people need to prioritize and respect the older people and that the older people need to prioritize and serve the younger people and vice versa, everything in, in between. In Psalm 78, it says, God established a testimony. He commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. God's design is for us to make sure kids know God and believe in God, so much so that they make sure that the kids in their lives know God. That's God's design. And he does mean, first and foremost, this is the pastoral prayers and not the sermon, by the way. He does mean, he does mean that the parents 
or the family or whoever is, is supposed to start there. But the Bible also teaches in other places that we need the church to help us do that. And all of that was to get me to this point of saying, y'all, today was a, was a huge day, a monumental day in the life of our church. As it's the first uh, Sunday in September, and it's our first Sunday in six months of having kids Sunday school. Under the leadership of one of our pastors, Matt McBroom and his wife, Liz, we've seen our kids ministry grow. We've expanded to another kids class. We have more teachers. We have more kids. And for as long as we can remember, this is the first time where there are kids and lots of kids in every class, and there will every year be more kids transitioning into the next class. That's a beautiful thing, and I praise God for it. I want everybody here to hear and understand that our desire is to our church to lead you guys so that you can lead your families at home in discipling your kids to know and love God, but at the same time, for you to feel like that coming back at it, you have a church that is helping you do that people that will love your kids, people that will care for them, know them, pour into their lives, and teach them the truth about Jesus. Today was a huge day in us being able to see that, and we are thankful for it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much that we see you telling us just straightforward in your word that children matter. Telling children matters. Lord, help us to do it. God, thank you so much for those that serve and those that lead. Thank you for volunteers that are able and willing. Father, there is lots of time, there are lots of times working with children where it is tiring or frustrating or just seems like nothing good is coming from this. And yet, God, it is still totally worth it. We know that. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us thus far. Thank you, God, for families that trust our church. God, thank you for servants that are uh, of high character that we know that we can trust. God, thank you for children, for families, and for grandparents and parents. Lord, we pray that you would make us a church, not where kids come just because it's fun, but where kids come because you are working in their lives. You are building friendships and relationships and helping them look to you. Father, we have heard many, many testimonies in our lives where somebody says they grew up in church and it did not serve them well. God, we pray that you would guard us from those experiences. But Father, we have often heard many testimonies where people grew up in church and for all of their adult lives, they looked back and were grateful for people that loved them and taught them and held them accountable. God, we pray for more and more of that. Lord, we pray that you would find us faithful, and yet we admit our inadequacy and our dependence upon you. We ask, God, that by your grace alone, you would work through this church to give children a setting where they can believe you and know you. Lord, help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, turn the Bible to the book of James. Today we start chapter two and we're moving right along. You know, I wrote in the newsletter that came out this Wednesday that we've heard a lot of feedback since we started these sermons in James and that's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, and that's a good thing. We've heard a lot of feedback about James and one of the things that we've heard a few times from a lot of you all is people saying, man, James is my favorite book of the Bible. There's several of you in the church that say, James, your favorite book of the Bible. Well, when we get done with verses one through 13 of chapter two today, I want to see if it still is, okay? Because we've already seen that James does not play around. This is the first book written in the New Testament. James was a brother of Jesus, and he does not stand for any, any hypocrisy or fakeness about us, okay? And uh, so James comes. We had a lady on Wednesday night say, in our share time on Wednesday night, we had a lady on Wednesday night say, James often just smacks us in the face. And yes, he did a few times in chapter one, but he certainly does here in chapter two. Read with me, if you will, at chapter two, the first 13 verses. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. 
For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man, and not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, lest we think that James is over the top and James has forgotten the gospel and James is legalistic, he says there at the end, mercy triumphs over judgment. And so before anybody gets distracted by this hardcore passage of James chapter two, I want to remind you all, right, what we just sang, and of course Andrew Crawford does an outstanding job picking these songs. Come ye sinners poor and needy. I will arise and run to Jesus and he will embrace me in his arms. No matter how much sin is in your life, you can and you should turn to Jesus. Even today even right now, even if it is all the pride inside of you right now to maintain that you are nice and good and pretty and have it all together and you would hate, you would hate to admit that you have been living in sin, listen, God would accept you back if you will turn to him. His mercy is over judgment, okay? Now, James says that so that you and I would be honest about our shortcomings and the judgment that comes against sin in, on, 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 our, on our way in the direction of receiving mercy. Now, the judgment is for those who will not come for him and receive mercy. And the mercy is those who will admit, without his mercy, I'm gonna be in the judgment, okay? So James certainly believes the gospel. He certainly understands grace, Grace with the law. He understands that we are sinners before God, but he understands that God forgives sinners. So with that said, here's the main thing. Partiality is sin. That's a hard truth for us to remember today. Partiality is sin. Because when we're not focused on what the Bible teaches, we drift into big things being sin, like James's example, murder and adultery, right? I think we can get everybody to admit that those are. But James also says that partiality is. You being unfair toward people for some reason. You like tall people better than short people. You like pretty people better than uglier people, right? When we are partial, to people like that, it is sin. Now, I wanna just slow down for a second and make sure you get that, okay? Because it's real common for us Christians and for church people to always admit, yeah, I'm a sinner, nobody's perfect, right? We're all human. But I want us to really feel the, the, the seriousness and the weight here this morning that we are guilty of a sin in our lives of being partial. It's not right. It's not good. 
I'm at the stage of life, I think I told you all this already, where I've got a lot of good movies in mind that I wanna show my kids, but I'm not sure if they're old enough to watch them. And so what age are they allowed to watch these movies, you know? And one that comes to mind is 42. It's one of my favorite movies. I love that movie, the Jackie Robinson movie, 42. And Jackie Robinson played in 1947 for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the first African-American to play pro baseball. Huge deal, y'all remember that? He died in 1972. I was born in the 70s. He died in the 70s. We're not talking that long ago. But there's a scene in that movie that I've never dealt with where they're just traveling to a baseball game on the road and the bus pulls over to get gas and so they all go to, to, go to the bathroom and they're not allowed to use the bathroom at the gas station because it's not for colored people. I've never experienced that. But what a conversation to try to explain to kids. They would be blown away by that. Hopefully they would be blown away by that if they saw that. That's being partial. Folks, that is sin. Now I say that because that's an easy one to recognize, I hope, right? Hey, anybody should be able to use the bathroom based off the color of their skin. But James brings up a different example here and he talks about rich people or poor people. But what's neat about it is he doesn't use those words necessarily. He doesn't use the word rich. He uses judgment that we judge simply based off the way we assume that they are. And we all know here today, in 2020, you can't tell how much money somebody has based off how they dress, right? You know that. I hope you know better than that, right? Just because somebody's dressed down doesn't mean they don't have money. And just because somebody's dressed up doesn't mean they do. Might mean they're in a lot of debt. And they're just trying to show out and look good. But James gives us a real life example that really does seem too good to be true. It sounds like what you would see on YouTube of an amazing, bold illustration from a preacher where he talks about two people walking into a church and how they treat them based off of how they're dressed. I mean, it seems so out there, like so strong, pushing the limits. And it's actually inspired scripture, holy word of God in the book of James. James says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now, I think you know that in treating people well, loving all people, there are uh, two different ways for us to understand this. There are believers, right? and how they are to treat people inside the church setting and how they are to treat other believers and how they are to relate. But there are also people in the world who aren't believers that are made in the image of God that are human beings and we need to treat them well as well. You're gonna see this here in James. He is speaking to a church. He is speaking to brothers and sisters in the faith. He's speaking to those who hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So today I want to just walk through a couple things, all right? My first point is do not show partiality. So partiality is sin, and so I want to push you with the very words that he uses in verse one, don't be partial. Do not show partiality. And under this first point today, I'm gonna give you three points about why that James is using. The first is that God is not partial, right? Remember, Paul wrote to the Ephesians that we are to be imitators of God. The Bible says that in chapter five of Ephesians. We are to imitate God. Y'all know what it means to be an imitator. I see what you do, Simon says, and that I want to do it. And God is not partial, okay? God is not partial. He, James already made this point, and Pastor Jake Beatty preached on this a few weeks ago. If you look at chapter one, verses nine and 10, it says this, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away, right? God pointing out that as a matter of fact, we would want the, the lower person to feel like they're not lower and we would want the higher person or the richer person or whatever to live a humble life to so much, so, so to speak, level the playing field if that's even such a thing. God is not partial. 
Proverbs 17, five says, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker, God. Proverbs 21, 13 says, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. In Romans chapter two, verse 11, it says very clearly, God shows no partiality. Romans 2, 11, God shows no partiality. And so what we have going on here in James, after he says, don't be partial, show no partiality, in verses two through four, we have this example. You got the man that comes in, gold ring, fine clothing. Remember, it doesn't say he's rich there, but he appears to be. Then you've got a poor man in shabby clothing. I think everybody understands what that is. And he says, they, if they pay more attention to the one who's dressed that uh, uppity way and they give him a good spot, perhaps they have ushers in that setting and they say, hey, come on in, man, never met you before. I mean, you know, come on up here, we'll give you a good seat here. And then the other person, the shabby clothing, they just kind of, you sit back there or something like that. This is the example that James gives and he's, and he's pointing out that this is not good. Right, This is not good, and God is not this way. God is not partial, which means if God is not partial, then that means God equally gives attention to people who have wealth and gives attention to people who do not have wealth, that neither one is a factor with God. We see that a lot of times in the Bible. We know of people that are wealthy and godly. We know of people who are poor and godly. You need to accept that. You need to admit that. You see this in the Bible, and I hope you see this in real life. Some of my favorite people, the most genuine people that I know, some of the most committed, Bible-believing, Christ-following people that I know are pretty lowly, and pretty humble, and pretty poor, don't have a lot of money, and have very simple lives, right? And I love that about them. And I can also say that some of the most genuine, humble, not judgmental, loving, Christ-following people that I know do pretty well, have big jobs, and still follow Christ. The issue is that neither of those gives you a leg up with God, okay? There is to be no partiality. But in order for us to really, really get that, we often have to speak up that we are committed to that which is not us. And so, you know, if you find yourself uh, uh, connecting more with the, the, the poor and shabby, then you have to speak up and say you're okay with uh, the uppity. And if you find yourself, and I'll let y'all choose which one you are, but if you find yourself uh, more committed to the, to the uppity, you have to speak up that you're okay with the, the poor and the shabby and that you, you, you don't judge them and you have relationships with them, right? And you see this often in the Bible. This is what I'm trying to get to. In Luke chapter four, right after the temptations, right after the baptism of Jesus, Jesus says this, quoting from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are the words of Jesus. God sent him to the poor, he says. Matthew chapter five, verse three says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke chapter six, verse 20 says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Then the opposite, the contrast, again in Luke six, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. All of this is to point out that God is not partial. If you're here today and you think because you have a good job or you've saved your money or you have wealth or something like that, it has not brought you any closer to God. And if you're here today and you're struggling and you think, man, I just have a hard time. I'm just trying to make it. I can't even keep a job, right, and all of that. That has not brought you any closer to God. It has not brought you any farther from God. God is not partial with these things. We need to understand this. As a matter of fact, when Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and they're wrestling with these things as they were, he describes the believers in this way. For consider your calling, brothers, 1 Corinthians chapter one. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. 
Perhaps you remember when God sent Samuel to go find the new king, David, the little shepherd boy, and Jesse had all these sons, and they were big and strong, and they looked kingly, and none of them were the one, and Samuel's like, what's going on here? I just went through all these, all these sons of yours. Which, one, which one's the, 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 uh, gonna be the king? And it's like he's got a little whisper in his ear that there's another, and he says to Jesse, hey, hey don't you have another one? And Jesse's like, yeah, man, but he's a little young boy, scrawny. He's not what you think of when you think a king. And God says to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God is not partial. God is looking for people who believe him. And on the outside, if you look fancy, or on the outside, if you look shabby, now again, just for clarity, anytime I say poor and shabby, the rest of the sermon, those aren't my words, those are James's words, okay? I'm not pointing out that anybody's poor and shabby. That's James's word, all right? But whether you look nice with a ring and something else, or whether you look poor and shabby, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is where is your heart? How are you about your sins? Do you confess your sins? Have you run to God, come to God? Are you broken before him? Commentator Robertson says, God does not accept the outside appearance for the inner reality. He does not, and nor should we. God is the God of reality. Where is your heart? Where's your heart before God? Does your outward living match up with your inward belief, your faith? God delights especially to shower his grace on those whom the world has discarded and on those who are most keenly aware of their own inadequacy. James then, this is commentator Moo, James calls on the church to embody a similar ethic of special concern for the poor and the helpless. Church, if God is not partial, then, there, then we should not be partial, for we want to be like God. So we do not show partiality because God does not show partiality. It says that directly in Romans 2.11. But my second point under number one, so 1B is, even when we try to, and we've got all the justified excuses why it's okay for us to do that, listen, we are inaccurate judges. Do not show partiality because God's not partial. Do not show partiality because we are inaccurate judges. Look back to verse four. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? One of the clearest points to me on all of the partiality and just divisions and judgment going on in the world today is that we're just not good at it. No matter what guys are arguing over, dividing over, or pointing fingers at these days, they're just not good at it. They're so inconsistent at it, right? And any argument you wanna make over here about anything, right, the other side of that argument will turn around and make a different argument right back. We're just not good judges, we're inconsistent, we're inaccurate, especially if it's not objective, truthful stuff. Now, we really struggle to be uh, accurate with objective, truthful stuff, too. If you wanna be honest, you wanna watch the news and see how ridiculous they are at it and being unfair and impartial, but when we're talking about things like the way somebody dresses when they walk into church, we're really, really bad at it. As I was reading and preparing for this, I didn't wanna really give y'all any real examples of this, but just to, to let you in on it. Many of the commentators told story after story after story of churches saying, there's somebody in the church that's humble and lowly and awesome, been a faithful church member for 10, 20 years, and never, ever, ever got asked to be on the finance committee. But the new banker in town started coming to church and hardly had made a profession of faith, but just about as soon as he had said he wants to be a part of the church, said, hey, you wanna be on the finance committee? That type of stuff is not good. That's partiality. We're inaccurate judges at these things. When we get to chapter four, verse 12, you will hear James say this, there is only one lawgiver and only one judge, he who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? God is the judge, and we are often not very good at judging. When we attempt, the expositional commentary of the New Testament says, when we attempt 
to discern people's value based on external features, we not only try to usurp God's role as judge, but we fail miserably in the process. We aren't good at judging people. We really aren't. How many times have you heard somebody say, man, he's such a good kid, and as soon as the adults aren't around, he's not a good kid. And how many times have you seen somebody say, man, he's a troubled kid right there. He's a mess. He's really not. Got a hard life, but a pretty good kid. Right? We're just bad judges all the way around. We need to see this here. This is James's point here, that we are making distinctions and judges with evil thoughts. Commentator Robertson points out here, and let's notice this, we have no way of knowing whether these two men were Christians or not. We don't know if they were Christians, we don't know if they were simply Jews. Both seem to be strangers, don't they? In the passage here, it seems like they're strangers. The courtesies extended to them were based purely on the appearance of how they dressed. Would, be, would we be as shallow as that? That we would be more friendly to you by the way you look? That we would be more courteous and hospitable by the way you dress or the car you pulled up in? I hope not, church. We are bad judges, inaccurate judges when we do that. Robertson says, riches and poverty are not essential criteria of your character. Amen. Riches in poverty do not have to have any effect on your character. You can be jobless and broke and be a man of God and keep your word. And you can be perfect on the time clock and save every dollar you make and have your heart hell bent against God. They don't have to affect your character. When we start thinking that it does, we are bad judges. Another commentator says, they are judges of evil thoughts and act with partiality and bestowing courtesies on strangers in the house of God. All this is in such marked contrast, listen, to the spirit and conduct of Jesus that one can hardly credit his eyes when he sees it happen in the church. Listen, let's be honest here. I hesitated to say this, but listen. It is increasingly difficult to get poor people to come to some churches. The churches themselves may sometimes become suspicious that the very poor come to the church to receive financial help, and so that breach widens. That's an honest statement. We have to be the ones who go over and above what is normal to show that we're not good judges. So we want to treat people without partiality. Do not show partiality because God is not partial. Do not show partiality because we're inaccurate judges. And then thirdly, finally under point one, do not show partiality because partiality is not truly loving. Partiality is not truly loving. You see where he goes here in, in, in uh, James chapter two. Look at James chapter two at verse five. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him, right? So in other words, in, in saving us, God is not doing it because we were pretty or because we were rich. He's just saving whoever he wants to. And he often says it was the poor and lowly and the foolish in the world. That's what he says. And so how can we be the opposite of that? Verse six, but you've dishonored the poor man. Not the rich ones who oppress you are the ones who drag you into court. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And then he goes into the love discussion. Look at verse eight. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Now this is the only place in the Bible where you have this called the royal law. I don't know if you've heard of that before. We don't hear people talk about the royal law that much. Perhaps it's because James was writing before we get the rest of the New Testament and they changed it up. You've got the golden rule that we got from Jesus, which is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you don't want people to be partial to you, then you don't wanna be partial to people. That's what it says. You want people to love you, you love them, right? That's Jesus' golden rule. But you've also got what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know that one. But what was the next greatest commandment? 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, here James calls that the royal law. To love. To love people. To love your neighbor. And in that passage of the Good Samaritan, which we all know about the Good Samaritan, Jesus points out that the question is asked, who is my neighbor? Because we don't want Jesus to say we have to love everybody. That's why they ask the question. Jesus says, love your neighbor. And they say, well, who's my neighbor? Hoping, hoping, hoping that it doesn't mean everybody. And just guess what Jesus said? It does mean everybody. It does mean we have to love everybody. You love your neighbor as yourself. And if you are, then you're doing well in not being partial. You're doing well in living out a faith that works. You're doing well in looking like Christ, in being godly in the world. As KB points out, there are zero exceptions to Christ's command to love your neighbor, zero. No religious exceptions, doesn't matter what religion they are. No sexuality exceptions, it doesn't matter how they identify sexually. No ethnic exceptions, it doesn't matter what they look like, what color they are, what language they speak, where they came from. It doesn't matter if they're legal or illegal, if they have their papers or if they don't. It does not matter, we are to love them. There isn't even, listen, there isn't even an enemy exception according to Jesus. If they are your worst enemy, if they hate you, if they want to kill you, Jesus says, there are no exceptions, you are to love them. Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies enemies. Yes, he does. God calls us, listen to this, I'm still quoting KB, God calls us to stand for what is right, but never to hate those that we perceive as wrong. Whether they're poor and shabby or rich and fancy, we are to love them. We are to treat them the same. Douglas Moo says, love for the neighbor extended by Jesus to all people, including those different from us, requires the poor, shabbily dressed people be given, listen, as much respect and attention as the well-dressed and the prominent. And extending James's principle, the love command also requires that we enthusiastically welcome into our church meetings people from other races and that we give as much deference to people with no status in the community as we do to famous politicians actors or athletes. In Christ, as Paul puts it, as Matt McBroom read earlier, in Galatians chapter three, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for if you are in Christ, you are in Christ and we are equally the same. He goes on to say, in obedience to our King Jesus, Christians are to build among themselves, listen, a genuine counterculture in which the values of the kingdom of God rather than the values of this world are lived out. Folks, everybody you know and everybody nearly on Facebook is divided right now. They are lashing out. They can't hold back their opinion. They're saying, man, I really want to, but I can't stop giving my opinion, right? And that's what the world is getting. That's the way it seems, right? Everybody you talk to is saying that. If you want to have peace in your life, if you want to settle down, I had people tell me this week that they can't stop being angry because there's so many punks out there in the world and so many nasty people on social media. I had people tell me that this week, right? We need to look like we just sang in the song, Behold Our God. We need to set our eyes on God. We need to behold our King. And we need to realize that our identity is we love people. 2020 is almost over, the election's almost here, but guess what? No matter if it gets way worse, and it could get way worse, no matter if it gets way worse, no matter what happens, good or bad, whether the person you win or want to win wins, the person you want to lose, lose, whatever happens, guess what? God reigns. He reigns. 
He's on the throne. He will not be shaken one bit. He has a purpose for what he's doing. Regardless of what you think about it, he's going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and the people that follow the Lord Jesus Christ are to look like Christ. And we do that by loving people. I don't care who they vote for. I know this, when I turn on and try to watch, because as my kids are growing up, right, the thinking is, well, I want them to be informed. Wouldn't it be nice to watch a debate with the kids? And yet, there's no policy hardly in that at all, right? If you listen to Trump for a few minutes, it's just Biden's an idiot. You listen to Biden for a few minutes, it's Trump's an idiot, right? And they just insult and insult and insult. And you're not gonna have a conversation in your living room about policy that much. You're gonna have to have a a conversation of your kids asking, why do they talk about each other that way? Can we not expect that those that we are so into to have high character? And so what happens is we're not even able to do that. And I don't really care who you like. That that, that doesn't matter to me. My point is, we're not like them. We are not like them. That's not how we roll. We don't point the finger at how ridiculous he is and point the finger at how ridiculous he is or they are. We don't do that. We love. We love. We hold back judgment. We wait for the place. We serve. We get low. We bow down. We shut our mouths. We're quick to hear, slow to speak, as he said last time. And we're slow to get angry about it. Stop getting angry over these guys. Love your neighbor. Royal law. Don't be partial. And in the way that we are not being partial, it's because we're not being loving. And yet Christians and churches are able to build, as Moose said, a genuine counterculture in the world where we love people poor and fancy, low and shabby. Now, what's really awesome about this is that we have no idea why they are that way and James still tells us what to do about it, doesn't he? What if that, what if, what if that, what if that rich guy was as honest and upright as you could possibly be? I mean, what if he was a look you in the eye, shake your hand, would return a penny if you dropped a penny? What if he was that? Still don't get any favoritism. What if that poor person was was a bum and didn't work? What's James say? No partiality or no impartiality. That's what James says. Because we got these biased judges inside of us. We're inaccurate judges. James says, whatever their story is, you treat them right. That's what James says. Don't show partiality. The royal law forbids the partiality in church. It is more than an error of judgment or a breach of etiquette. It is an act of sin, a slip in ethics, a missing of the mark that is fraught with grave consequences. It is bad enough to be convicted by the law as transgressors by this servile regard for the rich. Listen, it is worse to note the evil effect on the church and the community. A church of a clique is doomed. A church is only of use, listen to me, when it is open to the people who need the help of the gospel. The church opens its doors to let people in. It does not put up bars to keep them out. And if it hasn't dawned on you yet, often your social media is doing that. People don't want to talk to us because of what they post. And we think it's a witness. It's not a witness. It's not a witness. So, number one, do not show partiality. Number two, partiality is sin. Look at verse nine. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. It is a sin to be this way. It is a sin to prioritize a rich, seemingly rich person over a poor person. That is sin. And let me remind you that the Bible teaches us that sin is bad. The wages of sin is death. And James is about to go into this thing of, well, if you've committed one sin, you're guilty of all of them. And we we know that, right? 
Now, this is not to say that all sins are created equal. Obviously, the ripple effect is way bigger for some sins, right? Some sins can keep you out of positions and all of that, but it is to say that all sins are bad before God and all sins make you guilty before God. Even one sin makes you guilty. Now, it's interesting that the Bible points that out because none of us are guilty of just one sin. So we have lots of sins in our lives. But the Bible does say even one sin makes you guilty and convicted. And that should bother us. And it's neat that James goes there because it seems like that part of our response would be, yeah, it's so hard, Josh. And what about this? And yeah, but, and there's some good in, in it. And that's how we get to thinking and reasoning and justifying and all that. And James says, it's sin. And we are supposed to be bothered by that. Because sin is anything that is against God, omission or commission, something you've done against him or something you have not done that he asked you to do. And the Bible says here at chapter two, verse nine, that it's sin. I want to ask you, are you convicted by it? When we treat educated people better than uneducated people, does that bother you and hurt your heart? Do you have some family, listen to me, that's really got it together but they're not in church? Maybe have some money, education, look nice, and you keep inviting them, you'd really like to see them get involved. But you got some family that's not as to get together as you, perhaps a little embarrassing, a little shame, and so you really haven't invited them to be honest, you would kind of rather them not come. It's partiality and it's sin. I've heard people say quite a bit, it happened to me recently here talking to somebody, where somebody told me they had some family that lived right here in Fairdale, 40118, this small town. And I said to them while we're standing in the sanctuary, why don't you bring them to church with you? And their answer was, they're not really church people. Folks, it's partial if you think a single one of us were church people before we became church people. Until Jesus forgave us of our sins, we weren't church people. That's partiality. And it's sin. And God hates it. And God's not that way. God wants us to believe that the dying Lord Jesus on the cross was the blood shed by an innocent, holy, righteous son of God so that whoever would hear that message could possibly believe that message and be right with God, forgiven of their sins. And God wants us to, to extend that message and extend that love and that compassion and that sacrifice. God wants us to extend that to every single person. Does it bother you that partiality is a sin? Does it bother you when people are not treated right? James wants us to see that it's a sin and it's bad. Number one, do not show partiality. Number two, partiality is sin. And then lastly here, let's wrap this up. Number three, even with that heaviness from James, there is forgiveness for the sin of partiality. We are not to be beat up over this. We are to be convicted and turn to God and say, God, make us Christians that love well. Make us Christians that judge well. Make us a church that receives people, that welcomes people. There is forgiveness for this sin. Look at verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So he's pointing out that any sin makes you a transgressor. You've gone where you shouldn't have gone. You have done what you should not have done. And it wasn't the murder, it wasn't the adultery, it is the, impartial, it is the being partial that is the sin here. So verse 12 says, 
So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James gives us a quick reminder here that the way we treat people is a good reflection of how we've been treated. But not just in our relationships, because that's a good practice, it's a good kind of a, a way of examining, right? If people are nice to you, then maybe you'll be nice to people. That's the way it should go. But he wants us even more so to understand that this is the way the Christian operates. God loves me, so I go love. God serves me, so I go serve. God forgives me, so I go and forgive. That's what he's saying. And so when there is this judgment without mercy in us, it would appear that we don't know mercy. Is it, is it possible for us to say, oh, God has been so merciful to me, and yet us not be merciful to people? Especially based off of if they're rich or poor, how they're dressed. Is it possible? Is it possible to bask in, right? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Is it possible for you and I, dirty, filthy sinners, to stand under the flowing blood of Christ that paid it all, that washed us clean and say, I'm forgiven, I'm the chief of sinners, I'm a wretched, I am a mess, but God loves me and forgives me. Is it possible for us to bask in that mercy and then go and be judgmental toward people that we don't know? How horrible is that? How not of God is that? And so James points that out. But then his last sentence in the same verse says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And so while there is a world of people out there with a lot of judgment, a lot of judgmental people these days, Christ's people are to have mercy for we've received mercy. Christ's people are to come to him for forgiveness and then go and forgive. The discrimination, Moose says, that James's readers are practicing is the opposite of such mercy, and if they continue on this path, they will find at the end of their lives a judgment. Our ability to show mercy instead of partiality and judgment is a sign of God working in us. It is such unsettled times, as y'all know, that many, many are looking for something good, true, and refreshing. It is such unsettled times that we are all looking, right? We hesitate to turn on the TV. We hesitate to scroll through the internet, right? Because there is so much. We literally watch the news, the kids walk in the room, we turn it off, right? You couldn't watch the Derby yesterday without seeing a lot of stuff that you don't want your kids to see. Where's the light gonna shine? Where's the salt gonna come from? Where's the good, gracious, humble, lowly, kind, tenderhearted grace gonna come from those who have their eyes on Jesus and therefore they will not be partial. Church, let's let the world see that we will treat them well because Jesus treats us well. Father in heaven, thank you for James chapter two. May we be convicted today of partiality in our lives. May we welcome people. May we love people. Father, thank you for James being bold as he is and for us walking through it. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins and specifically the sin of partiality. Lord, thank you that there is forgiveness there. Lord, help us to represent you well and may those around us, God, be refreshed at how genuine we will be to them, that we love them even though we may disagree with them. 
Father, do this work in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we sing this last song, let's, let's respond. Perhaps before you get to singing, you want to just seek the Lord and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Ask God to help you be impartial. If you're here today and you're ready to turn to Christ and get right with God and follow him, I can help you do that. We'll help you do that. If you're here today and you wanna be a part of a church that believes the Bible and follows it, and you can come forward and let us know that. We're committed to walking through God's word. Here today we get James chapter two. Last week he got on us, this week he gets on us. Guys, it's exciting to think that God is helping us be like him. As we sing this final song, let's respond. Oh